Hola, hola, and welcome to Cultura en Cash. This is your host, Giovanna Gonzalez, otherwise known as Gigi, or the First Gen Mentor. I'm an influencer, financial educator, speaker, and author of the best-selling book, Cultura en Cash. But today, we are not here to talk about me. We are joined by our very first guest, the fabulous Janice Torres from Yo Quiero Dinero podcast. If you don't know Janice, Janice is an award-winning Latina money expert. She became an accidental entrepreneur after a job loss led her to create a successful Latin food blog, Delish Delights. Now she helps her clients and listeners build successful online businesses that allow them to pursue financial independence and freedom. Janice is on a mission to educate marginalized communities on topics like entrepreneurship, investing, and financial independence through her personal finance podcast, Yo Quiero Dinero. And today, we're going to talk all about her new book, Financially Lit, which was published last Tuesday, April 30th. And I do want to remind you all, I am hosting her for a book tour in Chicago, May 7th at City Lit Books in Logan Square. You have to pull up. Janice, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be your first guest. Like, damn, that's amazing. Thank you for having me. I'm so stoked. No, I'm, I can't think of a better first. Like, you're like the queen of Latina money podcast. So the fact that you're gracing me as the first guest, I am so honored. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Janice, you're too kind. <laughs> Janice, thank you for being here. Uh, again, if people don't know who you are, they must be living under a rock. Because like I said, you have the number one Latina money podcast. For folks who, who are new to you, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you went from being an engineer to an accidental entrepreneur? How does that happen? Yeah, uh, with absolutely no plan. So I went from being a burnt out engineer to now a full time podcaster and personal finance educator. I dove into the world of personal finance back in 2016. I hated my job and I literally Googled, how do you quit your job? And I discovered the financial independence movement. I discovered podcasts like Journey to Launch. And I was like, Shout out to Jamila. Shout out to Jamila. Jamila is incredible. And she is the reason why I started my own podcast because as a Latina, I couldn't find anybody speaking about money to me. Um, And seeing her as a fellow woman of color, like talking to a community that's largely been ignored by the money conversation, I decided to use my engineering brain because I have been trained and educated in how to find solutions to problems. That's literally what I got paid to do. And so I found the problem. We're not talking about dinero in our community. And so the solution was my podcast, Yo Quiero Dinero, which is now a five-time award-winning podcast. And on the show, I get to talk to incredible people from our community, primarily people of color, who are doing incredible but normal things like building wealth and buying real estate and becoming financially independent. Because for me, the thing that helped me on my journey was seeing other people do it. And so now I get to be the person that introduces my community to others who are also doing incredible stuff when it comes to money. It's so true. And I'm so thankful for your podcast because when I was going through my financial education journey, I think you were just starting your podcast. Mm. So I hadn't come across it. And um, instead I had to listen to a white woman, which (laughs) I'm not going to say who she is because she's great, but um, there were a lot of unrelatable things. So I'm honestly jealous of the generation that came after me that gets to listen to Yo Quiero Dinero and all the amazing podcast guests that you have that share our stories, that share our struggles, because that's really how we start to think, okay, this money stuff matters for us too. It's not just for white people. It's not just for the rich. Yeah. So I'm so thankful you have your podcast and I recommend everybody listen to it if you don't already. Thank you. Um, Yeah. So you had this blog, Delish Delights, which ultimately was what allowed you to quit your corporate job. Yeah. So I was actually in the process of building that food blog when I got laid off. Right, right, right. I want to know the moment that you decided to start the blog. Was it just like a fun hobby? Were you trying to make it a side hustle? How did that come about? Yeah, it was definitely not part of the plan to make any money doing this. And that's why I say I was an accidental entrepreneur because the fact that I was able to monetize it and now it's a six figure income stream for me. It's just like, I feel like I've unlocked the matrix. And this is why I talk to people about the importance of diversifying your income and just finding ways, especially with the power of the internet to make more money. Uh, Because about six months before 
uh, I got laid off, I started the food blog. And when I did get laid off, I got a severance check. And instead of rushing back to find another job, I decided this is a prime opportunity for me to like play entrepreneur for a couple of months. I knew I had a cash cushion. I had an emergency fund and this severance was going to last me at least three months. So I said, I'm going to pretend like I work for myself. I'm going to literally dedicate my days to creating content, to understanding how people are turning blogs into businesses. And that's exactly what I did. I spent a lot of time at the University of Google and YouTube. And I took a, um, actually, this is really cool. Like, it's one of those things where like divine timing definitely plays a role into some of my success, where food blogging was just becoming something that people were teaching. And so I lived in New Jersey at the time. I went to a 90-minute food blogging business class at the mm -hmm. Institute of Culinary Education in New York City. And I met a blogger, Just a Taste, that's her handle. And she literally went through the entire process of like what it takes to scale a blog from just a hobby into a business. So I started learning about fascinating things like how to become an influencer, how to get brand deals, affiliate marketing, how do you monetize the traffic on your blog? And that for me was like a huge light bulb moment because I realized that this thing that I thought was just going to become a hobby, sort of a creative outlet from the fact that I hated my engineering career and I just wanted something to be able to come home to that was something outside of that identity, that I could actually turn this into a business. And so it took me about seven years to make it to the point where I was earning six figures. But in between there, I was just learning more about money in general, started listening to podcasts and realized if I can crack the code on creating passive income and online income through this blog, this is going to be my ticket out of corporate. And so when I knew, like when I made that decision, I'm like, we are going to figure this out. And it's yeah. like, there's no room for excuses. There's no room for failure. I don't care how long this shit takes me, but I'm going to use this as my tool to get out. And that's exactly what I did in 2021 when I said, peace out to corporate life, all thanks to my food blog. That is so freaking cool and <laughs> such an inspiring story because, you know, a lot of people get laid off, especially in tech right now in the tech industry. And they think it's like the end of the world. And, and sometimes having that time away to either kind of explore yourself or explore a potential side business uh, or a different career, right, yeah. really is a blessing in disguise. And it seems like that's what it was for you. So I'm so happy yes. that you really turned lemonade out of lemons, mm -hmm. um, which leads to my next question. And I know this is something you're very passionate about that nine to fives aren't as stable as we were told they are. Yeah. 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 So um, my question to you is knowing that, and, and, I'm, and I agree, by the way, I used to also think that it, it was a stable way to have a W2 job. Mm -hmm. And after seeing layoffs or seeing just corporate politics, things that happen, right? And you're just yeah. like, oof, maybe, maybe you controlling your destiny as an entrepreneur, maybe that is a safer route. Do you think everybody should be an entrepreneur or how do you know somebody is made to be a good entrepreneur? So I'm going to be honest. I feel like not everybody has the mental fortitude to do this. But what I do think everybody needs to consider is even if you love your job, your job might not love you back at some point. And so you need to be actively creating a what the heck do I do if one day I walk into work and I got a meeting with HR and they hand me over an envelope and a severance check and say, hey, you got 30 minutes to pack your stuff because it's literally what happened to me. I didn't even have a chance to like process what was happening, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, I think that if you have a quote unquote stable income, you must take some of that money and diversify it in some way. Whether we're talking about investing in stocks, whether you are buying real estate that then you're going to use for cash flow, whether you're using some of that money to buy existing businesses or start your own, you just cannot afford to be dependent on a single income stream at this point because one is too close to none. And especially in the era that we live in where pensions are no longer a thing, there's no guaranteed retirement income. By the time we retire as millennials, Gen Z, et cetera, we might not even have social security. So it's literally like if you don't diversify your income and start building wealth, you're pretty much guaranteed to retire into poverty. And I think a lot of us are experiencing that firsthand with parents, especially if you're in an immigrant community, parents who literally do not have a plan and you are the plan. 
And if we know that that's what's staring us in the face as reality because we're seeing it with our elders, we have a moral obligation to our future children and also to ourselves because God knows we work hard as hell in our community and we should not be working our whole lives to have nothing to show for it at the end. So everybody needs to be diversifying their income, whether that's with a little side hustle that you do here and there, whether that's you picking up a second job, which I know there was people doing that during the pandemic, working two Mm -hmm. remote jobs, like get creative because we literally cannot afford to put all of our eggs in one basket when it comes to financial security. I completely agree. And I'm so happy you're sharing that with my listeners because I desperately needed to hear that when I was younger and no, I was lied to and told that as long as you have that office job, you're good. But but it's true. For me, I shared my burnout story, how I um, got sick at work because I was working so many hours. Had I had a side hustle or an mm-hmm. additional income stream or at the time an emergency fund, yeah. I would have been okay. So I'm so glad that you had your blog going for you. And, and, and it's, it's a really, really important story. Um, with that being said, though, I know a lot of women are on the side hustle bus. They're like, okay, I get it. I know Mm -hmm. I should have more than one income stream, but I barely have time in my day. Like I'm just exhausted after doing my nine to five. What do you say to those people about how they too can start a side hustle? Yeah, I think our biggest deficit, especially as women, is our inability to ask for help. Because more often than not, you have some sort of support system around you that you need to start leveraging. Whether those are fellow moms and you start doing mom swaps and child care swaps so that you get a couple of free hours a week, whether that is a parent who is, you know, an aging parent who is at home, who's about to retire. And you're like, mom, I need a couple hours a week of child care because I'm trying to build this business because not only am I trying to do this for us, but for you and all the things. Yeah. Um, Remote work is a really great way to make more of your day when you're not spending hours of your day commuting and going back and forth. Like I know that for me personally, remote work was very important to my overall financial independence journey because Mm -hmm. it gave me extra time to work on my business. I did not have to spend 90 minutes each way commuting. So, Mm -hmm. and also you're going to save a bunch of money because you're not commuting and you can eat at home and you're not like BSing buying lunch every day. So there's a lot of things that we can do to optimize our time. I think the most important thing is just be okay with asking for help. You do not need to be the perfect mom, the perfect wife. That's one of the things I talk about in the book. It's like society has us out here thinking you got to be the perfect wife, mom. You got to be going to the gym seven times a week. You have to be cooking five-star meals for your family. No, you don't. No, you don't. What you need to do is start asking for help and putting some boundaries around your time so that you can actually pour into yourself because too many of us are depleted. We are giving to the people that we love from the scraps that we have left over. And it's like, Mm -hmm. of course you feel resentful and you feel exhausted and you feel like you never have time. You're, you might be self-imposing that to be honest. And we got to take a look and kind of do an inventory of where our day is going and start getting a little selfish. Yeah, this is so real because, <laughs> yeah, as Latinas, we're just so self-sacrificial. So so with Marianismo, right, it's such a thing in our in our community. So we're not taught to outsource or to get a nanny, right, or to have yeah. somebody deliver your groceries for you. That's something that I've implemented in the last year, and it's been a life changer to pay 15 bucks to have Instacart deliver my groceries instead of Same, bro. I refuse. I don't even go to the grocery store anymore. I'm like, you know what? Somebody else could do that for me. I can give somebody some money to take something yeah. off my plate. I love yes. that for you and for me. It's true. Yeah. And I'm more rested. And of course it costs money, but the fact that I get my time back and my energy back, that's worth more than the 15 or 20 bucks that I spent on grocery delivery. So that is a very important mes- message that more Latinas need to hear. Um, I did have my, um, Instagram community share some listener questions. Uh, this question came in. So do you have any tips on talking to family about money, especially if you're the oldest daughter? Mm, hi. Hello, all the eldest daughters. Welcome to the club. Um, Are, we okay? It's, Are we okay? No, we're not okay. <laughs> we are not okay. Um, well, I'm going to share something that I have not publicly shared at this point. As the eldest daughter, I recently had to confront a very real family emergency, which is my father getting laid off after 30 years at the same company. And he's like 18 months away from, you know, traditional retirement age. And this was not part of the plan. 
All right. And so as the financially secure eldest daughter, I'm trying not to spiral because there literally is not much of a plan as far as like, oh, what are we going to do? So I think it is at our best interest or in our best interest to have these conversations about what the hell's going on financially with our families, because one way or another, you're going to be confronted with it, whether it's with a layoff or whether it's with someone getting sick and not being able to work anymore. There's just so many things that we have to anticipate. And the more, you know, the more you can plan. So a couple of years ago, I sat down with my parents and I got real with them. I'm like, Y'all are 60 plus years old at this point. I need to know what's going on with your retirement accounts. I need to know what's going on with debt because I'm going to be the one that's going to have to figure this out and navigate this when you guys Mm -hmm. get to the point where like you're retired. And they were uncomfortable, awkward conversations because it's almost like you're shifting from the child to the parent. There's this weird dynamic that happens where your parents are just like, well, why do you need to know all that? But it's also like, well, what do you mean? Of course I need to know about it because I'm the one that's going to be left dealing with the repercussions of all the stuff that's been done. So it was an uncomfortable conversation, but I got to understand their financial situation. And from that, I've been able to start planning because I know the day is eventually going to come where neither of my parents can work. And then it's like, okay, so what's the plan then? So some of the things that I've done practically to be able to weather the financial storm is one, create a family emergency fund. And this is a topic that I talk about in the book. I'm like, why? I don't know why nobody else talks about the fact that our families should also be a sinking fund, especially if you are a first gen kid who is pretty much supposed to be your you know, parents' retirement plan. So I have earmarked money that is set aside to help my family with financial emergencies, whether that's an unexpected tax bill, a car repair, a home situation, whatever. I know that I can extend financial help And there are boundaries around it because there is a specific dollar amount. And once that dollar amount is done, we got to get creative. We got to start looking at other avenues and resources. On top of that, I am a firm believer that you must put your oxygen mask on first. And this is something Mm -hmm. I mentioned in the book. Like you are not going to be useful to anybody until you are good yourself. And so another thing that I did in anticipation for this season of my life is securing my own retirement. My retirement at this point is good. If I never invest another dollar, I'm going to retire with about $4 million. Wow. Okay. And Mm -hmm. so the concept of coast financial independence is something that I want more people in our community to understand because once you actually get to that number where your retirement is pretty much guaranteed financially, it is much easier to extend that help because you know, future you is already taken care of. I think a lot of my listeners won't know what coast financial independence is. Can you uh, explain to a five-year-old what coast financial independence is? Absolutely. And so I've actually dedicated an entire chapter of the book to the financial independence movement, because even though it's something that has been talked about for decades in other communities, it's still a very novel concept for us to understand this Mm -hmm. idea that retirement is not actually an age, it's a number, right? And Mm -hmm. so coast financial independence, I would argue, is probably the most realistic version of financial independence for most of us to pursue. And it's essentially a concept where if you can get a certain amount of money into the stock market by an early enough age with the Mm -hmm. power of compound interest and just the way that the stock market appreciates 10% year over year on average, you can get to a number where you just set it and forget it. So the earlier that you figure out that number, obviously the easier it is because you have the power of time on your hands. But for somebody like me, let's say you're around the age of like 35, 40, you probably want to be in a place where you have anywhere between $300,000 to $500,000 in your investment portfolios, and then you just walk away. And you can pretty much guarantee your Meaning you don't add more money. You don't add more money. Exactly. So Mm -hmm. between dividends and capital gains and just the power of compound interest, that money will continue to accrue to millions of dollars. You know, obviously we can't predict what the future holds, but historically with the performance of the stock market, that's a way to almost, you know, safeguard your, your retirement. And then once you can stop investing for retirement, you can start your marking all this money that you would have had to put in the market towards other things like financially supporting your family. Yeah, I love it. And yeah, especially since we're not really going to receive this 
windfall of an inheritance from our family. It's so important for us to secure our own financial future before really like diving into our parents. And yeah. Cause otherwise we're just repeating the cycle. Right. And it's just like, yeah. we already know what that looks like to be completely unprepared. So knowing that there are other options, if you want to break the cycle of poverty and generational struggle, it's the best gift in the world to give your child the knowledge that they can actually do whatever the hell it is they want with the money that they're going to earn because they don't have to earmark any of it for you because you've taken care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Or for somebody like me, that's child free and I don't have children to pass money on to just like a big act of self care of, of knowing that I work my whole life and when I'm old and tired and achy and I just want to kind of take naps and read books and chill, <laughs> I can do that because yes. the younger version of me put in the work to, yep. to be uh, financially solvent. So no, it's, it's such, I think that's great advice. So let's pivot to uh, the writing process of your book and then we'll dive deeper into the book content. Sure. Uh, I'm really curious to know um, a little bit more about the traditional publishing process just because when I was on your podcast we talked about hybrid publishing and I think a lot of listeners found that helpful so you got a book deal congrats Thank uh, you. tell us yes yes tell us um, what was the timeline a realistic timeline because I think a lot of people would love to get a book deal but they don't understand all the work that goes into behind the scenes so can you briefly give us kind of like an overview of of how long it took from the moment that you're like I want to write a book to the book actually now being here right okay so um, I think before I get into the timeline, I will say that the most important part of this process is really getting a team of people around you that believe in the mission, because the more that the people around you believe in it, the faster this will come to fruition. Mm -hmm. So I think the first inkling of me needing to write a book came in 2021. Um, I had at this point, I was doing the personal finance podcasting full time and I realized, you know. I have courses and people can work with me as a coach and stuff, but I also wanted to create a super accessible way for people to learn this information the same way that the podcast does. And there's just something like really powerful about having your words on paper that will live on way after I'm gone. Yes. So 2021, I made the decision. And at that same time, I found out that my mentor, Farnoosh Tarabi, was putting out her next book, A Healthy State of Panic. And so I was listening to her podcast and she introduced her book publishing coach, which her name is Rochelle Fredson. And I said, if our news trust this woman to get her a book deal, I'm going to talk to this lady. Mm -hmm. So I set up a meeting and we decided to work together. She immediately understood like the importance of this book needing to exist. And so I started working with her in January of 2022 to put together the book proposal. So for anyone who doesn't know what a book proposal is, it's basically your outline for what this book is going to be about, how you're going to market it, what qualifies you as an expert, what are your contacts, your network, you know, you want to list all the social media influencers and all the important people that you know, and you're even going to write some sample chapters to show a future publisher, this is what you're going to be investing in if you decide to publish my book. Mm -hmm. So we put that together, it took about three months and it was like four months to the day from when I started working with Rochelle that I had a book deal. So I started working wow. with her in January and in May I had the book deal. Wow. That's fast. And the reason why that happened is because part of the package that I decided to invest in with her included introductions to agents mm -hmm. and publishers. Mm -hmm. So I basically bought like access to people without having to do my own research and cold pitching and none of that stuff. I said, I don't know anybody in this industry. I don't know anything about writing a book. So I'm not going to be out here pretending to DIY because I've done enough DIY as an entrepreneur. I'm over a decade into this. And I know DIY is a recipe for struggle and regret and burnout and exhaustion. I'm like, I am way too far in this game for me to still be getting cheap and using the excuse like, oh, that's too much money. I'm going to go. No, this mattered enough for me to invest in it. And so I got the book deal in May. Um, I actually signed the contract like probably August or something, which is crazy. It takes so long for you to actually get the contract. But mm -hmm. from the moment that I verbally Did she negotiate that for you or did you need a lawyer? Yes, my agent did. My agent did okay. negotiate. I ended up talking to five publishers and getting an offer from one. So I went with that publisher. And honestly, even if I'd gotten multiple offers, I still would have gone with them because A, my editor was going to be a black woman. 
And I'm like, mm-hmm. of course, I need a black woman being the editor for this book. There's no way I'm going to convince a Chad Chaddington about why this book needs to exist. <laughs> um, and just the, the entire team has been women, like from my editors to the publicists to everybody that the the traditional publishing house has brought on board for this project. Everybody's gotten it. And everybody's been so incredibly supportive. Um, as far as writing the book, it took me May to July of the following year. So like a, a little bit over a year, you know, I was navigating divorce and personal stuff in that time. So it took a little bit longer than it was supposed to. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much like a three year process to from like deciding that the book needed to exist to it actually coming out. But yeah. it's been a really fun educational journey that I'm hoping to share more as time goes on. That's so cool. And again, congrats, because it is no easy fee. And thank you. Yeah, the industry is very white. And that was very smart of you instead of like, I don't have these connections. Let me buy my way into this. Do you feel comfortable sharing uh, how much an investment that would be to hire? Um, what is it like a literary agent consultant or book proposal consultant or at yes. least like a ballpark? So our listeners know. It is not cheap to hire help when it comes to the book writing process. My book proposal coach was five figures, somewhere around $12,000. And then I hired a secondary editor that was like independent from the traditional publishing house because I felt like I needed so much support as a first time author that relying on feedback from somebody who was like trying to help a bunch of different authors bring their book to life, it just wasn't enough support. And we both agreed. Like I spoke to the editor at the um, the publishing company and she's like, yeah, you probably would be better off hiring somebody to support you in this process just so we can maintain the the timeline. And so hiring a secondary editor cost me $18,000. So like, I'm, you know, 30 grand into the book and obviously that eats away at your advance, but this is why, and I know we're going to talk about the importance of this and we already have, is the importance of multiple income streams because writing a book can have a huge financial impact on your business, especially if you have a single way of making money as an entrepreneur. And so one important thing that I want to know about what I was doing behind the scenes in preparation for writing this book, because I knew it was going to take so much of my time. I wasn't going to be able to launch new programming like I usually can. I was creating a lot of processes, a lot of systems to turn courses into evergreen, to use automated funnels, to grow my list without me having to always be, you know, dancing on TikTok and Instagram. <laughs> and so that gave me the space to be able to write the book and not be stressed out about money. Because it's a real thing, you know, it's a real thing to like take that financial hit as a business owner when you want to create this work. And so uh, that was an important step that I took in preparation for all this as well. A smart investment because I mean, yeah, you started in January and by May you had a book deal. That's such a quick turnaround. So I think that was a very worthwhile investment. And and I'm glad that you had the wherewithal to be like, I can't DIY this. this." Yeah, no, awesome. Those are hefa moves, you know, Um, (laughs) to close up the discussion on the book writing process. I want to ask you, what was your favorite part of the book writing process and the least favorite part? Ooh. <laughs> um, I think the favorite part was definitely writing a majority of this book in my condo in Puerto Rico. Like there was many moments where I was sitting on the balcony looking out at the ocean and just like mm. ancestors, this is happening. Like this is crazy. I don't know what was going on. What divine intervention has led me to this place, but just being able to write my book majority in Puerto Rico, where my family is from was just an out of body experience that I'm so grateful to have been able to experience. And the worst part of writing the book, I mean, I feel like, and I've talked to other authors who agree with me. It seems like life be lifing, especially when you're trying to write a book, you know, like I have to navigate the a whole divorce. You, sure. They're like, do you really want to write this book? <laughs> yes. Because the universe will throw really big obstacles at you. And for me, it was, you know, the process of getting divorced. I had to start figuring out how to date again in my late thirties. Like I had to move out of where I was living, find a new place to live. Just like there was a lot of change and transition during that period. And just finding the energy and like the mental fortitude to even sit down and write when there's so much stuff going on. Yeah. It was not easy. It was not easy. Yeah. But you still 
got us a damn book. You know, so <laughs> we that's, did it. that's amazing. Yeah, no, I mean, to go through the emotional toll of a divorce, uh, the, the change, right, a big lifestyle change, and to still come out on top with this beautiful book that's going to help so many Latinas is, is just amazing. But it's also good, right, to share the ugly parts because I think people think that writing a book is – very like you go to like cute coffee shop every day and you just yeah, everybody thinks away. it's sarah jessica parker on sex in the city i'm like ma'am did you <laughs> yeah. see the turmoil and chaos in her life that shit was not yeah. glamorous <laughs> yeah no exactly exactly no so it's uh it's it's not then there are going to be you know a lot of hurdles and and that's why it's so important to just stay committed to your mission i'm so glad that you were able to stick through it and, and get us this very powerful book so now let's go ahead and talk all about financially lit um, I was an advanced reader of your book. I love your cover. It's and so an endorser. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to yes. have your blessing. Girl, <laughs> no, I was I was so honored to do that for you because um, you have just made such an impact in the Latina community. And the fact that you're coming out with this powerful book is going to change so many lives. Uh, and you look so beautiful on the cover, by the way. Thank you. I love that you're on the cover. You talk about a lot in this book. Yes. I understand, like, this is like a Bible of financial literacy <laughs> because there's so many important topics that you cover. I mean, you talk about everything from financial trauma to building a budget, starting side hustles, investing in the stock market estate planning, negotiating your salary, and so, so much more. How do you decide what topics to cover in your first book? Because I'm sure this is one of many books for you. <laughs> well, you know, I was not sure if I'm ever going to get a chance to write another book. So for me, I took the approach of like, if this is the only book, I'm going to put everything. I'm going to do everything. Mm. You're literally going to be able to use this book to navigate any major financial decision you're going to have to confront at some point in your life. And I definitely have to say I took inspiration from Ramit Sethi because Ramit has written a book that has stood the test of time. It's very timeless in its advice, but it's also very like contemporary as well. And so I said, if I only write one book, I'm going to make sure that everything that I wanted to say is in here. And that's exactly why it's so jam packed with information, because I didn't want to take the risk of like just you know, focusing on a couple different aspects of personal finance and then never getting a part two. So I said, I'm going to go in, go all in or go home. Yeah. You can tell this is a book that had a lot of thought go into it because it is value packed with so many important subjects. And, um, that's not easy to do. That's a lot of information. <laughs> so kudos to you to be able to pack all this into one book because, yeah, some of the stuff might not be relevant right now, like the estate planning, but this is a book that as you age, it will stand the test of time and you'll be able to go back to that estate planning chapter, yes. right? Yes. Uh, so no, this is amazing. This is amazing. Uh, and let's see here. You have a, a section of the book where you talked about the importance of paying off debt. Um, a lot of us know the debt avalanche method and the debt snowball method. Um, a quick rerun for anybody that doesn't know, debt avalanche is when you focus on the highest interest debt. Uh, and the debt snowball method is when you focus on the lowest balance debt. But in your book, you introduce us to the debt lasso method, which I've never heard about the debt lasso method. Can you tell us what that is and how it works? Absolutely. So the beauty of being a podcaster is that you meet so many interesting people. And this concept was introduced to me by the creators of it, which are the debt free guys. They also have a podcast. I want to say it's called the queer money podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, so this was something that I didn't even realize I did in my own debt freedom journey. I just thought it was a smart thing to do which is reducing as much interest as possible when you're paying off those credit cards or personal debt. So basically the concept is, you know, those introductory 0% balance or, um, you know, interest cards that are out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you take advantage of those offers. Obviously you have to have pretty decent credit to qualify for a lot of these offers, but essentially you open a new card that has a 0% interest for a certain amount of time. I remember one of the ones that I was able to take advantage of was the city simplicity card that had a 0% interest for 21 months. Wow. And it also had a 0% balance transfer fee. So what this wow. meant is that you could take money from other credit cards, put them on this one. You're not going to pay any money to move it. And you're not going to pay any interest as long as you pay it off in those 21 months. 
So what I did is I, I consolidated all my credit card debt onto these new balance transfer cards, and I made a plan to pay them off before the promo period ended. And this is how I was able to pay off over $10,000 worth of credit card debt. It's just using these balance transfer offers to essentially pay off your debt with no interest. As long as you have a solid plan, I think it's one of the most underrated, but really, yeah. really impactful ways to pay off, especially expensive ass credit card debt. Yeah. Cause otherwise you just keep paying that credit card and the balance isn't going down. Yeah. Uh, and even if you pay more than the, than the minimum payment, it still hardly moves the needle. So yeah, being able to transfer your debt um, to something that's zero percent for something as close to two years. You said twenty one months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost two years. That really uh, freezes that interest rate for you and allows you to really attack that debt. You know, I think the trick here is to stop using the credit cards and yes. to really focus on paying it down. Because I've had friends that they do this balance transfer offer, they don't finish in time or they didn't yeah. make any significant change and here they go transferring again and they usually do have to pay a fee because there is a balance transfer fee for the cards that they've had. Um, so it's not about just kind of like kicking the can up the road. It's about taking advantage of that promotional 0% interest. So that's super cool. How, do you know how the lasso part comes into it? So it's pretty much, you imagine the concept of taking a rope and like taking all the different debts and consolidating them onto this oh. one card. So it's like you're putting a lasso around all the debt with the credit card. <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah. And, I and this is a really some... opportune time to like, when you do take advantage of those offers, this is when side hustles can really, really pay off. Because what I was doing too, mm -hmm. my food block at that point was already making like an extra two to three grand a month. So I was mm -hmm. throwing that extra money towards the debt and being able to pay it off in that time. So I think the most important thing about this whole concept is like, Make a plan to pay it off. Divide the number of months by the balance. See what that payment looks like before you open any credit cards. Assess what the different offers are and make a plan because even if you can't pay off the full balance in those 21 months, you can take the remainder and then put it on a new balance transfer card and kind of right. restart that clock. But this is why it's so important to have good credit, which is also a topic that we talk about in the book. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise you won't even get the option to do that if mm -hmm. you have more credit. So that's a yeah. really good benefit. I, I love the Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso, <laughs> the debt lasso method. And, and yeah, I've used some variation of it. I just didn't know that it had a name. So that's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, Janice, next, I want to move to a chapter that I really think is going to capture the readers. <laughs> uh, because there really is nothing like it, honestly, in the Latina uh, personal finance community. And this chapter is about love and dinero. And before we get into your story, I too want to share that this is a topic I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm actually doing a campaign right now about the importance of financial compatibility while dating mm. because mm -hmm. I didn't make that a priority <laughs> when dating Girl, my, yeah, my now spouse. And I don't know that that was your story too. And we'll get into that. So you talk about the importance of financial compatibility, but also I'm so happy you talked about prenups and postnups and making sure that you're on the same page and that you have financial independence from your partner. Because um, my grandmother, I recently learned uh, has been trapped in a 60-year mm. marriage with my gaslighting serial cheater grandfather mm -hmm. because she didn't have the resources to get out. You know, so on the outside, people see it and, oh, how cute. They've been married 65 years. This woman's been miserable. Wow. She, she wanted to leave, and she told me, Giovanna, if I could have left, I would have. But what skills did I have? I had five kids to feed. You know, so I feel awful that, that so many women still today fall yep. into those situations and I hate the stupid trend of the trad wife is like no oh it's so toxic so, it's so backwards it's so back or if you are doing stupid trad wife make sure that he's paying you into some account that only you Facts. have access to he's paying into um his spousal retirement account too but yeah it's so toxic because oh my god anywho yeah but so yeah so I love that you dedicated a whole chapter to talking about the importance of it. Um, do you feel comfortable sharing with us a little bit about your love and dinero story? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, I navigated a, div a divorce while writing this book. And so this chapter was not even a part of the original proposal. This was something that I put in after the fact, because I'm like, mm. oh, wait a minute. We got a whole ass part of money as women mm -hmm. that we're completely ignoring. And there's so much taboo, especially around talking about relationships and money and the impact that that can have on you. 
And I'm a firm believer that the person that you pick to marry can be your best investment or the worst investment, depending on how they operate, what their money values are, and et cetera. So my ex-husband and I were at the opposite ends of the financial values. Like I was always very responsible financially. I always lived below my means. Um, and he was completely opposite. He's just like, you know, rack up debt, don't pay it off, collections, defaults on our student loans, got into legal issues. It was just like chaotic. And I don't know if it was due to just probably like my naivete as like a, you know, 20 something year old Latina that I'm just like, whatever, you know, everybody's got issues. You, you've you been together X amount of years. Yeah. You just, you just figure it out. And if you've invested X amount of time into a relationship, like the next order of business is just, you get married just because of the sunken costs. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Like there's, this is one of those things where I think a lot of people end up marrying somebody just because it, you've been together X amount of time and you're not actually assessing what's my future going to look like with this person. Are they capable of growth? Are they constantly improving? Are they interested in learning about money? Even when I started doing this full time and teaching people on the internet about money, he had no interest in learning. And that for me, you know, now looking back, I'm like huge red flags, just somebody who just has too much ego in order to not be able to admit that like, you just don't need to be the smartest person in the room all the time. Like you can actually take advice and learn from other people. So long story short, um, the marriage was full of emotional abuse gaslighting, infidelity, and financial abuse. So one of the things that I talk about in the book was he had racked up legal debt because he liked to drink and drive. And it was a repeat thing. And I found out one day that my $10,000 credit card had been maxed out. I logged into my account and I'm like, what, what the hell's going on? I didn't use this card. So I found out that he charged like $10,000 worth of legal fees onto this card and when I confronted him about it, he's like, but what's the big deal? I was going to pay you back. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So I'm now on top of everything. I'm like in a financially abusive relationship at this point. This is crazy. And that's why I wanted to put that um, topic in the book as well. So in that chapter, we talk about financial abuse and what it looks like because in 99% of abuse cases, finances is also a factor that is keeping people stuck. And especially mm -hmm. when we look at the women in past generations in our families, we all have examples of relationships that were way past their expiration date, but the woman had no financial recourse in order to be able to walk away. And so I feel like in this time, in this age where we as women can build wealth in ways that our grandmothers could not, we have a moral obligation to protect that wealth because just one generation ago, Women could not have their own credit cards. Women could not have their own bank accounts. Women could not buy real estate without a husband's name on them. There were so many things that we have the privilege to have access to. And so this is why we need to be having conversations that were not had in the past. This is why we need to be talking about prenups and estate planning and protecting yourself from financial abuse because it's been happening. We just haven't had tools to prevent it. And now we it's do. It's always been here. Yeah, it's you're right. Always it's nothing here. new. Yeah, no. it's always been there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, so so I'm really excited about the impact that this chapter is going to have because I hope it forces a lot of couples to have really uncomfortable but very necessary conversations. Because if y'all mm -hmm. can't talk about money, there's going to be a lot of other shit that you can't talk about either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you marry somebody, it's like a legal <laughs> It is absolutely agreement that's they what people don't shot. understand like everybody <laughs> that's married has a prenup whether you know it or not you either have the one that you create with two attorneys or you have the one that is imposed on you by the state laws in which you got married so the question is do you want the government to be all up in your financial business when you get divorced or do you want to have a say about how those assets get divided up beforehand while you still love each other not when you hate each other because it's right. much easier to negotiate with somebody when you still actually like them. Exactly. And Janice, I know that you did not have a prenup, but you did get a postnup. Can you share what that conversation was like? And was he resistant to it at first? Was he like, okay, whatever? 
Yeah, I love this question. This is something that I actually provide scripts for in that chapter because a lot of people don't even know how to like initiate these conversations. And so I give you a lot of different scenarios to be able to bring up the conversation. But for me, it was primarily because I was focusing on transitioning from full-time employment to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And so in that process, I spoke to a CFP and she recommended setting up a post nup because there are risks that are associated with starting a business. You know, I'm taking mm-hmm. on a financial liability that could potentially affect our marriage in general. If I end up getting sued and there's a bankruptcy and all types of things that can happen in business, that puts my potential partner at risk. And so I think because I took it from that perspective, like it was not a weird, awkward conversation to have. It wasn't something that I had any resistance from him. And I think it also helps that we never commingled our finances. We always had separate finances. And so it wasn't this matter of like, oh, well, now we got to go and do like forensic analysis on the accounts and like who's what and whatever. So I think if you know that you want to protect your wealth, like have this conversation sooner than later. It's Mm -hmm. one of these things that you're going to be glad you did it, but you're going to be so pissed off that you did not. And especially for my entrepreneurs who are listening to this, your business is a marital asset that is subject to divorce proceedings and it can get really expensive and really ugly. Yeah. So yeah, no. word to the wise, get that damn post nup or prenup. We, we <laughs> needed to hear that. Yeah. Whether it's before you get married or even after you get married. And Janice, I'm curious, how much does something like a post nup cost? Because for me, that's been a barrier of like, mm-hmm. well, how much is going to cost thousands of dollars? I know that in the future, it would be better for to have to pay that money. <laughs> but can you give us an idea of what something like that would cost? Yeah. So it can cost anywhere between no dollars, which it was for me. And I'll explain how I did that to like, you know, $2,500, $3,000. That's not an unreasonable amount of money for, you know, documentation that's going to protect you and your millions potentially. So I actually got my post nup for $0 done because I took advantage of a little known workplace benefit called legal insurance. So open enrollment time, I want you to pay attention. If your job offers legal insurance, it can be literally like $7 a paycheck. And what Mm -hmm. it does is it covers all types of legal stuff, whether that's buying a house, creating prenup, negotiating. If there's like employment law issues, if you get into a car accident and you got to take somebody to court, it covers so many different legal um, incidents, right? That can cause cost a lot of money. And it, one of the things that I covered was estate planning. So I was able to create my post nup and my estate plan for literally zero dollars. Okay. I'm talking about a will, a trust, a living will, a power of attorney for nothing. So take advantage of legal insurance, please. That is so smart. And you know, the reason employers offer this is because all these big life moments affect their employees, right? So if you don't have the post nup or if you didn't have this and this set up, it's going to affect your workplace performance. And they're like, yep. let's give these people the option to opt into this. And that's amazing. And I hope more companies offer that because what an amazing benefit to give to your employees. Uh, last question, Janice, as we wrap up our conversation, how do you want your reader to feel? after reading your book, after pouring so much of your energy, your wisdom, your knowledge into this book, what do you want them to feel? I want my readers to finally feel seen and understood when it comes to the conversation around money, because I think for far too long, wealth has been something that we associate with whiteness. And I promise Mm -hmm. you, it is accessible to you too. Okay. These Mm -hmm. tools that exist have been in existence for generations. We just haven't been privy to how others have been able to use them to create generational wealth. But with the levels of education that Latinos are earning, with the increases in pay that I'm seeing, with the increased levels of entrepreneurship, we are at sort of the cusp of what is possible for us as a community. And it's about time that we harness these wealth building tools like investing, like real estate, like entrepreneurship, like financial independence to actually show all of the effort that has been done. You know, like I want us to have physical evidence of like how hard we work because that's the thing that frustrates me so much about our community. It's like, we're the hardest working people in show business. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like we bust our asses. We make things happen. We are so fucking resilient. We have so much 
that is trying to hold us back and yet we rise. Mm -hmm. But the thing that has been a consistent roadblock for us is navigating the world of money. And because money is power, it is our responsibility to harness that power. So I hope that when people listen to this book, they finally feel like these conversations are for them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I close out the book by basically welcoming everybody to the financial revolution, because I know the world will be a completely different place once Latinos have wealth. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want. I want, I want a bunch of rich ass friends that we can go and enjoy life and not repeat the struggle and really become examples of what is possible for the future. I love that. I love that. That is so beautiful. And I want to thank you for writing this book for us. This book is so needed. It covers so many important money topics. And I have read the book and you can totally <laughs> hear Janice's voice <laughs> the whole time through it. So yeah, if you listen to her podcast, you're going to love the book. Janice, tell us where can people buy the book and where can they learn more about you? Absolutely. So you can find out more about the book as well as order your copy, both the physical copy and the audiobook version at financiallylitbook.com. That is also where you will find the book tour stops, including the one in Chicago, where I'm going to be joined by the fabulous Gigi. And I can't not wait to give her a big ass hug. <laughs> yes, that's tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so that'll be tomorrow, May 7th at City Lit Books in Logan Square. Absolutely. Um, and you have a couple of book tour stops, right? So if people aren't in Chicago, where can they find other cities that you'll be in? Yeah, so I have those all listed at financiallylitbook.com. I'm going to be heading to Miami, Orlando, New York, Dallas, Dallas, and more stops to come. So please, I would love to see you get your book signed. And really, like, I want you to also bring a friend because yeah. the power of this community, if yo quiero dinero, is the people. The people are the power. And so the more people that know about how you can use dinero to become financially poderosa, the better. Yeah, no, totally. Thank you, Janice. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing so much wisdom. Thank you for writing this book. Everybody listening, please buy her book. Again, it's really good. Uh, and we need to support Latina authors. You know, she mentioned how much of her own money she had to spend to even get the book started. This matters to her and it matters to us as a community. And it'll her representation will encourage more Latina authors, more diverse voices to enter this space. So please support her work. It's a great gift. Graduation season is right around the corner, right? So gift it to your prima that's graduating, your sister, your mentee. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful gift to be able to give the gift of financial literacy to somebody that's young when it matters the most. So Absolutely. again, the buy a copy keeps for yourself. Yes, buy a copy for yourself, <laughs> buy a copy for your loved ones and, and support Janice's book. But again, thank you, Janice, for coming on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening. See you next Money Monday.